uh, symptoms to be worse. Um, and that's because for many people who have spinal cord injuries, your, your chest muscles, your abdominal muscles have been impacted. And so you um, aren't able to take the same deep breaths or uh, clear your secretions in the same way. Um, and so it can lead to other challenges. Um, so recommendation wise, it's pretty much the same as for everyone right now. Keep, um, keep yourself socially distanced. If you are unwell, um, stay, stay home, uh, try to limit visitors. Um, and the, the difference is that when you, if you do get ill, you're gonna be contacting the, your healthcare system sooner. Uh, so if you are unwell, you're gonna be um, calling and kind of connecting yourself earlier rather than later so that you can get the care that you need. Um, I don't know if there's, I think that I might do better with questions. <laughs> so maybe later um, after, after we hear from others, then uh, if there's specific questions, then I can do my best to answer. I have them. a question. Can we, can Oops, sorry, sorry. sorry. Can you turn your speaker off? Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. How do we deal with healthcare that is that canceled? I don't know how to unmute that. Good. I think I think I heard it. How do we deal with healthcare workers that cancel? And that's a very good question. I think. Um, Right now, it's important to be setting up a plan B, C, D, E, F. You know, um, try to find contacts in your community. There's um, different groups that are forming to kind of be supports in your community. And so, and it goes both ways. Um, you know, if you aren't somebody that's high risk, then you can um, put yourself out there to support others as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, likely going to happen uh, that people are canceling either because they're sick or they have to care for um, care for others you know people, the schools in BC have been um, closed indefinitely so they may uh, have to take on caregiver roles for their children or they, they may not have kind of the same places for them to go so reach out to your community find find your plan B C D E what would be some of those groups that are helping people out? Um, so right now, there's there's many that are cropping up. So it's COVID-19, supporting others. Um, it, that one's one that's on Facebook, and they have it for many different communities. I know I'm in the Tri-Cities, and they have one for there. I know um, there's one in Vancouver, and I, um, I'm sure there's many others for other communities, um, but just... Uh, I think Facebook is a w great way where people are trying to keep connected and get connected to those that are around them. Um, can is I just Paul ask? Can is Paul Gauthier here? Oh. No, go for it, Paul. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I don't know if there's a hand up process or something like that, a button to put up our hand. But, um, you know, I, I just wanted to mention for people that are struggling with caregivers um, and not being able to come, um, if you happen to be on the CISO program, uh, there is an ability to be able to um, potentially hire for emergency purposes agencies as well um, as part of your backup plan. Um, I recognize that, uh, you know, some people may not want to utilize an agency, but um, if you're getting desperate, you are allowed to use your CISO funding. Um, also want to just mention that uh, the Individualized Funding Resource Center, who I happen to be the executive director of, um, may be able to uh, assist. We don't really do a lot of emergency coverage per se, um, but you could reach out to uh, our organizations to see if we happen to have some caregivers and they're looking for work at this point. Um, but, you know, hearing what has been talked about briefly, just 
keeping everyone safe right now in regards to, you know, following the hand washings and all those things um, is, is the real key to try and make it so that we don't have, um, you know, our caregivers off. But it is, a, it is a worry. I know that we've received a lot of phone calls, um, you know, stating that the caregivers are starting to say that they may not be able to come in and having that plan b b and c and d and stuff is going to be really needed mm -hmm. um oh sorry can i just ask so i just think for the use of everyone's time if we go through the three and paul i kind of just nominated you to be our third speaker um so i hope that's okay you can give us a bit more of a briefing on what you think people need to know with caregivers um, but uh, I'm going to go now to John Shepard, who's joining us from Toronto, and um, he is uh, a graduate student at U of T and runs a, a, um, a virtual coaching program for people with SCI, um, and he's sharing his screen. So he's got a, a presentation, and um, then we'll go to Paul Gochi, and then we'll do a Q&A. So everyone just hang on to your questions or type them in the comments and we'll make sure we get to them. Great, uh, thanks a lot, Jocelyn. Can everyone hear me and see my slide? The people on the call won't be able to see you, so try and describe as best you can. Fair enough, okay, thanks. Thanks for letting me know that there were people who are not on the video, okay. Um, so yeah, I'm a person living with spinal cord injury. I'm a graduate student in rehabilitation science at the University of Toronto. And I'm really grateful for the opportunity to join you guys. And I first of all want to say how pleased I am to see everyone gathering together in this way. I think it's a, a tremendous, um, you know, uh, way for the community to stay connected in, in these times. And um, and so uh, I, I want to encourage you to do as much of this as you can. I think it's uh, I think it's great. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about special considerations for SCI uh, and uh, people with SCI and, and COVID-19. Um, I'm going to look at a document that was pulled together um, last week by some Canadian experts in SCI with specific guidelines. So this goes uh, beyond what you would have seen from public health authorities. And I'm going to uh, drill down into issues that are a particular concern for people with SCI. This will overlap a little bit with uh, what the other speakers have said. Um, then I'm going to just share a few thoughts about surviving and thriving in self-isolation. I think this is a very challenging circumstance we find ourselves in, although uh, in some respects, it's perhaps more familiar to us than mo much of the general public. Um, so I'm going to try and share a few thoughts about how we can make the most of this. Um, and then just, uh, I guess, close by suggesting, I think, uh, we can help each other, rather we can help ourselves by helping each other in this very unusual time. Um, so special considerations for SCI. Um, I guess already we've heard about the particular medical vulnerability um, for people with SCI with respect to respiratory impairment, especially higher level injuries. Uh, I guess we're all aware of that. And so, um, you know, this is why this is a particular concern to us. And we have a lot at stake. I think there's another thing that, that is liable to be missed, but it's very important, um, which is that um, in a sense, regardless of, of level of injury, um, we're all vulnerable to social disruption in, in a particular way. Um, Oh my goodness, I have the wrong bullets. Sorry, I did the slides last minute. But um, there, there are several types of social disruption that can affect it. So obviously the disruption to attendant service, but also disruption in terms of access to supplies. I mean, some of us have probably noticed that we, although we use uh, gloves on a, on a daily basis and, and have never had difficulty obtaining them, now we are. Um, there's been a run on protective equipment. Um, so there are real issues there um, that, we, that we need to, to uh, think about as we, as we plan for how we're gonna get through this. Um, so, uh, a set of guidelines was prepared last week by some experts uh, in SCI in Canada, and they've been um, distributed through different organizations. I think a version was distributed by SCI BC. Um, I'm going to switch my share to show you um, a, a version in a minute, and I can share it, uh, the document with Jocelyn for distribution afterwards if that's helpful. Um, basically, we're looking at, first of all, prevention. Now, of course, there's general um, guidelines for prevention, but there are some specifics for SCI we'll look at in terms of self-isolation and hygiene. And then issues around attendance service, supplies, and specific 
issues for ventilator users. So now I'm going to quickly switch. And by the way, I'm not seeing the chat right now because I'm sharing my screen. So if um, Jocelyn, I can see you. If, if you need me to stop or something, wave and I'll stop. Otherwise, I'm just going to keep going. Great. Okay. So I'm going to share with um, da, 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 the document. And again, thumbs up, Jocelyn, if you can see the Word document. Great. Okay. So as I say, I will share this with Jocelyn for distribution for the group to the group, but I think another version has been shared with uh, through SCIBC. Um, and I'm just going to zoom through um, on the stuff that's really specific to SCI. Um, I think there's consensus that unless absolutely necessary, we should be staying home, um, except to get medical care or for uh, other vital um, uh, reasons. Uh, so I won't dwell on that further. We can we can talk a bit, um, but this really is a time to be minimizing uh, any unnecessary exposure. Um, hand hygiene is something that's mentioned uh, universally as a consideration. Now that's not quite so easy if you're a wheelchair user. If you're a manual wheelchair user, you may be wearing gloves, you may not. Uh, your wheel your hands are coming in, into contact with the push rims. Um, in short. Um, there's no good science on this. Um, and so the best advice is to follow normal hand washing protocols as much as possible. And then um, as much as possible, again, to clean um, your push rims, um, to be very careful about um, uh, contact with gloves. Um, and um, above all, this is another reason why staying in your home space um, as much as possible is a good idea to avoid uh, contamination. If you're a power wheelchair user, you wanna be mindful of, of cleaning your joystick. And again, any surface your hands come to uh, contact with. Um, you, if you have armrests, be, be mindful about cleaning those as well. Um, this also applies to things like a tray. Um, if you've got a tray in your wheelchair and assistive devices like splints, typing splints and other, other things you may use. Um, so there, there's a whole set of things there. We can, we can talk about that in the Q&A if you wish. Um, prepare your emergency supplies. This may be a problem both with respect to availability of funds. Many of us live very close to the edge and in terms of availability of supplies. So there, again, are real challenges here and we may need to help, on e help each other and depend on each other. Um, but again, within the constraints that you're operating within, you know, it is very wise to ensure you have a supply of med vital medications and, and medical supplies um, uh, to take you through, um, let's say 15 to 30 days, but really, you know, whatever's feasible for you. Attendant service issues. I'm, I won't do on this too much because I think Paul's gonna speak about it. Um, just take precautions with attendants who may have traveled outside of Canada, send home attendants who are not well. Um, so this means having a backup plan. Um, be vigilant about their hygiene. Um, and um, there is a document here that's linked uh, specifically about what precautions to take if you or your caregiver is in self-isolation and yet uh, you, you continue to receive care from them, specific precautions you can take. Um, I won't go over what you do if you're sick because I think that's in the general guidelines. There are specific things if you use a ventilator or cough assist device. And I would say in that case, you want to be very close to your healthcare team. Um, and uh, we're recommending at a minimum, you uh, be very vigilant about cleaning equipment, replacing filters and having an adequate supply of filters, tubing and other supplies. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna stop the share on this document uh, and go back to my other slides. Um, again, I'll, I'll be happy to share those uh, guidelines with Jocelyn for distribution of the group. John, so, I uh, shared the link in the chat and it's something that we've shared widely on our social media as well. Fantastic, yeah, so that's, that's out there and should be available. So then moving on to this question of surviving and thriving in self-isolation, because I think this is really key and it may be missed at first because we're preoccupied obviously with staying healthy and staying alive. Now, uh, let's say we're doing the right things to protect ourselves and, and we're uh, staying at home. Um, how do we take what's going to be um, a challenging time uh, and, and frankly something that's going to last for a period of time that no one knows right now and make the best of it and care for the rest of ourselves beyond just avoiding the virus? So I think um, we need to try as much as possible to stay productive, which is about uh, keeping routine, trying to keep a, a shape to your days. Um, so they have some structure um, in a way that is helpful to uh, whatever activities and pursuits you're, you're putting yourself into, if it's, if it's employment, if it's volunteer uh, activity. I'll say a bit, more, a bit more about that in a minute. Um, this is certainly going to be a lot to do for us to help each other. Um, as much as possible, be physically active. Again, you know, 
uh, space uh, sort of constricting and doors um, obviously limit the possibilities, but I think many of us are accustomed uh, to, to dealing with that and finding out uh, ways that we can do exercise programs, yoga, stretching, um, you know, anything that, that uh, keeps us um, having a sense of being uh, physically well, um, that's very important. And generally taking care of yourself. This is a time to be extra vigilant and extra scrupulous about all the things we do to take care of our bodies in every other way. So being super on top of our urinary health, being super on top of our skin health and all those other concerns, getting really good uh, sleep um, and, and, uh, and, and uh, eating well. Um, beyond that, there's, a, there's clearly going to be a real mental health challenge here to stay positive and to, um, and to be uh, res emotionally resilient. And I guess the first thing I would say here is that I think this is an occasion where it's appropriate to take this seriously. I don't think um, you know, it's helpful to tell people there's nothing to be concerned about. There is objectively something to be concerned about here. That's a reality. And I think there's, there's, it's entirely inappropriate to recognize that. Having said that, um, once you've done everything you reasonably can, once you have heightened your level of vigilance um, and scrupulousness about hygiene, uh, once you've taken all the measures that you reasonably can within your constraints, I think it's appropriate and helpful to relax and to say, I've done what I can um, and I can't control everything, um, but I'm going to uh, take comfort in the fact that I've um, done what I reasonably can. Um, I would say it's okay to feel what you're feeling, whatever that is. Um, don't feel bad for having whatever uh, feelings of being upset or anxious that you're having, because I think those are normal. Um, by the same token, again, I think it's okay and probably beneficial to the extent possible uh, to remain cheerful and positive. Um, I don't think you can will those emotions, but I think if you've taken the steps that you can to create a, a safe space for yourself, um, I think it's it's good if we can, as much as possible, um, you know, stay positive because because here we are, <laughs> and and here we are together, and and um, there's a lot we can do, and so let's uh, let's take heart. Um, and the final thing is, and this is very closely connected to that. Let's let's stay connected. So let's reach out to each other in every way we can. And we live in a time and a world where technology makes that uh, easier than ever before. So use those means wherever possible. Um, we have different levels of comfort with technology, but I think it's good to push ourselves in the direction of using those tools um, as much as we can. And, and I'm looking at this as an opportunity to reach out to people I've not been in touch with for a while. And I've started to do that. And, and that's really helped me. It's really strengthened me. Um, and, and, and and made me feel better. So I'd, I'd urge everyone to do the same. And so the last thought I'd share is that this is a time when we're going to be called upon to help each other in, in ways that we probably haven't in, in a long time, maybe ever. And, and I think uh, by doing that, we can help ourselves. Helping other people gives us purpose. And so I think we can address some of our own concerns by pouring our energy into being of assistance to uh, others. Um, and so I think that's a, we, that's a way we can really help ourselves. So I'll leave with that, but I'd be happy to, to speak to any, any of these things in the Q&A. Cool, thank you so much, John. Um, I just wanted to mention that we um, have some resources that are gonna come your way in the next couple of days about stuff you can do from home, um, low cost and free ways to connect and watch movies, re borrow books, et cetera, if you don't already know about those things. Um, and we're, we're working on um, a bunch of different ways you can connect with each other. Um, I think it's, there's a lot of folks who um, are sort of peripherally involved with SCIBC and if there ever was a time to accept connection, um, this is it probably. Um, so whether it's us or IFRC or um, other peer groups, definitely be connected, connect with someone regularly. Um, and okay, so we've got a couple questions. I see your questions. Um, we're going to go on to Paul and ask uh, Paul from the Individualized Funding Resource Center if he has a few remarks. Um, I've totally put him on the spot here because um, we weren't sure if he was going to be able to come, but I really invite anything you want to brief us on in terms of um, options, and I know there's some questions about caregiving and such in the questions as well. So, um, Paul, it's over to you. 
Thank you, and, and thank you for asking me to say something. And, um, you know, but just to pick up from where you left off there about, you know, uh, that working together concept, I think it's going to be critical that we all look at working together. I think that um, when we look at resources of organizations and stuff, but it's also uh, how powerful it is if we continue to support one another. Uh, I know there's many of us that are on the CECL program and, you know, at some point, you know, we may end up having caregivers going down. And this is maybe the opportunity to really uh, utilize your community and see if there's ways for CISO employers to connect with one another and maybe help each other. You know, I know that they talk about uh, family members checking in on uh, on individuals uh, with disabilities or seniors, but I think as people with disabilities, we could be checking on each other. And by doing that, maybe be able to reach out a hand in regards to offering caregivers and stuff if need be. And I know that's uh, a hard thing to do at times, but maybe something that we all need to be looking at doing. I did mention earlier about <clears throat> reminding people that agencies are something that we're allowed to do, <clears throat> excuse me, in regards to, um, you know, if we're lacking the ability to find staff. Um, there's been quite a few people reaching out, um, reaching out and asking about um, what, what about people that are returning from vacation, um, I need my caregivers, what are we going to do? Uh, we, we have put out to the Ministry of Health, a, a number, Ministry of Health and Health Authorities, a number of questions that CISO employers have had, including, you know, the fact that some caregivers we may need to quarantine themselves and uh, may need, uh, you know, that, that, but may want to still come to work because this is their own financial component. So we've reached out to the ministry to try and get some thoughts on this. Not that these employers can necessarily afford to pay for caregivers uh, that are away, but would they allow these employers to do that in some cases? Because we have some amazing caregivers that we don't wanna lose during this process. And would they allow us to be able to utilize any slippage dollars that some of us may have to do that. Um, in regards to adequate supplies, um, you know, many people are having difficulties in, in accessing supplies and we've reached out to, the, uh, to both the ministry and the health authorities asking if there's any way that people with disabilities could get access to some of their supply chain. Um, and we're waiting again for responses. Unfortunately, this uh, email that we sent out happened yesterday, so I don't have a lot of answers, but I wanted you to know that we, we have been asking the question because I think as people that are most vulnerable um, and acceptable to this contagion, right, it's so important to uh, see if there's ways to be able to access uh, some of this. Um, and. The other thing is around, um, uh, you know, uh, oh, in, in regards to agencies, I was mentioning how you're allowed to utilize agencies on an emergency cases. There is a rule within the CISO program that act, actually mentions that before utilizing an agency, you should uh, contact the health authority um, to do that. So be aware that that is a normal practice. Um, we have asked uh, the Ministry of Health and Health Authorities that they would, um, you know, uh, suspend, temporarily suspend that requirement um, so, um, so that people could just go right to the agency right away. Um, we've also asked about uh, immediate family members. Um, first of all, some of us may be in a position to be able to start communicating with immediate family members to be ready to be on. Uh, guard and support us during this period of time. We have asked both the Ministry and the Health Authority, specifically the Ministry of Health, if they would lack this as well and allow us to hire, um, uh, you know, other family members. Or certain family members are already allowed to be hired through the CISO program, but uh, we want to know just during this 
pandemic state, could they allow us to do this on our, our other family members, perhaps that aren't normally allowed to be hired? So, um, so we, you know, we will be giving updates on that. Um, th we've also asked, you know, that some people may not have enough funding to be able to hire the agencies. Uh, I know Bert Abbott was asking that question, and um, you know about you know could could some additional funds be available? Um, that is something that we're definitely waiting upon to to find out. The final thing is there were some uh, CISO employers concerned about the restrictions within hospitals um, in, in regards to that if they are in hospital, um, you know most of us allow our caregivers to be able to come to the hospital. Um, you know, it, it's a difficult time for the health authorities and, and for the hospitals right now trying to keep uh, this all contained. Um, but we have reached out to the health authorities to, to really stress uh, the importance that our caregivers uh, need to be able to come to a hospital because uh, the, the nursing system normally can't handle the demand of our physical situation usually. And um, so, you know, I noticed, we noticed that, you know, uh, in, in the Vancouver hospital anyways, there's a strong notice that only, that, that, uh, that family members aren't, you know, certain people aren't able to come into the hospital. So we just wanna make sure caregivers are able to get in. So we're gonna be working on that. But the messaging has been very clear from the other speakers about you know, using best practice. And I really just want to echo that, that that needs to happen and we need to be vigilant on that. You know, the social distancing and stuff. I mean, you know, if, if you're able to have a, a mask with your caregiver while supporting you while having a shower and stuff, it, it may be wise to be doing that. And, you know, uh, for me, I need to be fed. Um, you know, those kinds of things, making sure that people are washing their hands and all that. It, it's such a key. So uh, I just want to thank uh, Spinal Cord Injury for really putting this on today because I think uh, it's really about community and Spinal Cord Injury is about that. And I think for all of us as a community, we need to continue to work together on this. So thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Paul. I really appreciate being your willing to be put on the spot here. Um, we have a ton of questions. Some of them I think you've answered. Um, I'm going to go through a few of the ones in the chat, then I'm going to go to the couple of folks who are only on the phone because um, they can't indicate their questions any other way. So, um, so uh, Megan mentioned that there is an online uh, decision tool for uh, to uh, report your symptoms and see whether you should seek help. Um, and when and um, 811 uh, has been up and down but there is a decision support uh, guide and now Megan I can't find it I know you shared it but I'm trying to find it um, any any resources we share in the chat I'll email to everybody um, at the end um, including Paul's organization in case you want to reach out to him um, I, one thing to keep in mind to D Lynn Dunkley's point about at what point do you contact your healthcare professional? Um, uh, Ashley, I'd appreciate your input on this, but I, I heard you say that um, you'd w probably want to be uh, extra vigilant and contact early if you were showing symptoms. Right, yeah. So um, the BCCDC website that they've created um, where, where that self-assessment is, uh, going through that, it gives you the opportunity to say, yes, I have, uh, I'm an at-risk group, um, and then it gives you the right recommendations for you. So it'll tell you sooner than it would um, somebody who isn't a high-risk group to connect with your healthcare professional. Um, one common question I've seen a couple of times in the chat, and maybe you can answer, Ashley, I don't know, um, is what, I have a Botox appointment this week, <laughs> and um, someone mentioned they had a cystoscopy also scheduled. Um, should we be canceling? 
for the most part, any non-essential medical appointments could be canceled. Okay. Um, and I think you need to call the, I, I know I'm going to call after this, the clinic um, that I have an appointment with and double check. Um, and if they haven't canceled it, I will cancel it because there's a ferry between me and there. Um, but, oh yeah, there it is. It, uh, it was Allison that shared a self-assessment tool at the end there. Um, and the non-medical info line. Um, so let's see what other questions. So the other question is if you need a prescription refilled, um, most, uh, if it's just a refill, um, most types of medications are being refilled without a doctor's order or visit to keep the doctors free. And so you can call um, your local pharmacy for information about that. Uh, it's very likely they are not doing uh, opiates, like uh, triplicate prescriptions, so keep that in mind. Um, there's also um, Babylon Health and uh, EQ Virtual, I think it's called, the Medio uh, version to get a, um, a virtual visit with a doctor, or you can call your doctor and see if they're doing phone refills, if you need a refill of something you can't get done. Um, uh, okay, other questions. Oh, I had a question by email about um, how we should be cleaning things that aren't our hands. So um, things you touch when you transfer, things you use. Um, so for me, I'm a manual wheelchair user. Um, I wash my hands and then I usually have to touch my chair to transfer. So um, what's your suggestion, Ashley? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, some people, like for that scenario where you've washed your hands and now you have to touch your chair, some people will use like their paper towels or, or like a actual towels that they've used to dry their hands and kind of use that to um, hold on to things as they transfer or move over. Um, otherwise, your like high contact or high touch areas um, can be cleaned with your standard household cleaners. Um, if you're using like a wipe, it's recommended to do one wipe to start and that gets rid of kind of any, um, any of the material and then let it dry and do a second wipe to sanitize. Okay. Um, I'm, uh, I have read widely that um, this bug is, this virus is susceptible to most household cleaners. Um, you know, Pine Sol, Clorox wipes, Lysol wipes, um, as well, if you're able to get a hold of them. And if you can't find the pre-made wipes, one way people have suggested, and I've done myself, is to get a glass jar or a Tupperware jar with a lid and put some scrap fabric in there that has been freshly laundered and put a layer of the detergent over top and put a lid on it and then pull them out as needed wipe and then or use paper towel um, and then you can throw away or launder mm -hmm. we're all just trying to find ways around the shortages so i think that's a, a bit of a struggle but know that your household cleaners are enough they're just really not as convenient as the pre-made wipes um uh, supply shortages olivia's question is I had that problem in terms of supplies with gloves and masks. Amazon is a good resource for that stuff. And if you're on Cecil, you can claim those supplies. Um, I, I think folks have found a lot of supply um, shortages. I don't know if anyone has, um, any of our speakers have suggestions. I know Bert suggested to us recently that um, you can call your pharmacy and see if they have any um, for special populations behind the counter. Um, we know that chair stuff is out, sadly. Um, the ministry is looking for a way to deal with that as well. Ryan? Uh, I find that dollar stores and small uh, corner grocery stores are usually the last to go. Like if you go to big box stores, they're packed. Uh, the dollar store and the small, that's a Korean run little grocer on the corner of my uh, block and they're full of everything. Oh, wow, okay, cool. That's a good piece of advice. Um, McDonald Pharmacy indicated to us today that they um, have gloves, but no masks. Um, so this is a good option to connect with each other. 
Um, you can contact us at SCIBC or your local peer coordinator. Um, just spread the message widely about what you're looking for. And I've also found it's, um, I've been successful if you specifically tell the store, if you're ordering from them, that you are in a higher, excuse me, a vulnerable uh, population group that you need um, access to wipes or gloves or something, and they may put some aside for you. I wish I had a, a, a real um, specific, this works every time answer. I've not found Amazon to have any in stock lately, but they are prioritizing those supplies um, as of this afternoon. So keep looking. Um, and any, any of our speakers have suggestions on the supplies issue? Nope. <laughs> That's okay. Um, do let us know if you're chronically having trouble with supplies or if you're almost out for yourself or your caregiver. Um, because we are in conversation with um, the government at the moment about that very problem. And um, given that we've had, I think, three questions about it, I will definitely pass that message on. I think they're working on a way to um, get access to it from other means or prioritize people living in the community because they want us to stay out of the hospital. So, um, wow, there's a lot of questions. Uh, is How can we practice social distancing with our caregivers? Question. Um, I think that care is something that just very naturally has to happen quite closely. And so in those situations, it's uh, focusing on the hand washing, the uh, cough sneezing etiquette. Um, if you are unwell, then the, the recommendation is when you're with um, a caregiver that you wear a mask and that, um, that they use uh, extra precautions too, like a mask or eye protection. And um, if your caregiver is sick, uh, ultimately they should be going home. But if that's not an option, if your caregiver is a family member and you know they're they're um, just part of part of your life and your care, uh, then using as many barriers. Sorry, I keep going. Yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think that's kind of what you do about social distancing with caregivers. Just use as many um, kind of barriers or things that will break the chain um, of, of infection. Oh, um, John, are you, is that you? Yeah, Go I am. Yeah, so just to follow up on that, um, the document that uh, Jocelyn shared the link to, so the COVID guidelines for SCI on the SCI Canada website has a link to another document. This is from Public Health Ontario. It's a guide to self-isolation. This is not specific to COVID-19, but it does have general uh, guidelines. So it, exactly in line with what you're saying um, in terms of hygiene. And then in the case where your family member is a caregiver or your, um, you know, your, your family member or roommate uh, might be sick, there's some further advice about avoiding sharing household items, uh, cleaning, and so forth. So you can have a look at that. Awesome. So that's a, a link that's on the SDI uh, recommendations for COVID-19 that um, I put a link to in the in the chat. But again, that's another one we'll send out by email as well in case you are on the phone and can't. So let's go to the phone people. Um, I'm going to unmute you each. Um, bear with me. Um, I think so. I, by my count, I have four people on the phone. Um, if anyone has a question, now's the time to ask it. Anybody? No. This is Josh. Oh, Only a comment. Uh, Jocelyn, thanks for coordinating everybody and having these experts of the panel speak and educate this group. It's been really informative for me, so I just wanted to shout out to the coordinated effort and uh, the speakers here today. This has been awesome. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Um, anybody else? I heard someone else's voice underneath. 
Jocelyn, I was just going to comment. Uh, it's Paul here. <laughs> and I was just going to comment because there were some questions about the, the, the supplies and since when, for example, has the CECL program allowed the um, supplies to be able to be paid for through the CECL funding. Um, and that's been a couple of years now. Um, things like first aid, you know, first aid kit, um, supplies related to uh, universal precautions like disposable gloves, masks, hand sanitizer um, are also allowed as well. So uh, they, they, they give a recommendation of 20 to $40 per month that you're allowed to utilize uh, the CECL funds for, but they do acknowledge that you might want to buy in bulk. So uh, you can still submit your receipt for, you know, a few months supply um, through your CECL funding. Um, again, it's getting access to the supply at the moment, and I'm glad, uh, Jocelyn, you're following up with seeing how we can get access to supply because that's definitely an issue. But um, you know, I think I think it's our responsibility as employers to make sure that we have the supplies necessary for our caregivers. I think making you know making your caregivers bring it um, is 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 a nice idea, but it's our overall safety that to be thought about here as well. And to do that, I think we need to make sure we have the necessary supplies in the home. Definitely, and this this came upon us pretty fast. So it's pretty hard, I think, for us to, um, you know, if we weren't already thinking ahead and stockpiling and we had the money to do so, it certainly um, has caught a lot of folks off guard. I, I would suggest that um, social networks are your friend in this and put the word out. If you are in, if you are approaching an emergency need for gloves or um, kits or catheters or whatever, um, reach out, tell people you know, um, give us a call. We are not obviously a distributor, but um, we would like to know about it and um, and we'd like to see if we can help uh, connect you with people who have indicated they have extras. Um, obviously when they're things like catheters or vent filters and that sort of thing, that's a little harder, but um, we're doing our best to try and connect people who have stuff to people who don't. Um, and just knowing generally what the gaps are and advocating to fill them where we can. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges of this situation is that um, it's not just the outages of our, the products we need, it's that the entire system is under considerable strain and it's about to get worse. So I think it, it's also important for us to try and look ahead. Like if you look in your cupboard and you have one box of gloves and you need them every day, now's the time. Now's the time to look for them or if you only have like, now I'm wondering how many boxes of catheters I have. So take a look, try and try and anticipate going forward, start asking now. Um, and I feel like I'm telling you this and I hope I'm not offending anyone because I'm not assuming that you haven't done anything. You're here, so you've probably given some thought to, to the whole situation and what your needs are. Um, so there, there we go. Um, anyone else on phones that has a question? And if not, I'm going to go on to uh, any other um, questions. Yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, my name's Peter Chisholm. I'm a manual wheelchair user. And hey. uh, thank you very much for putting this on. Um, it's been very good, very informative, and nice to be connected. Um, I put a question in the chat around uh, wheeling outside. I've been inside for the past few days it's a lovely nice day today and i went out for a wheel i avoid people um is that a risky thing to do or is is that okay ashley yeah so uh going outside is a beautiful thing to do and i think you're um putting you're putting things in place so you're putting yourself at less risk you're staying away from people you're fully washing your hands often you're not touching your face um your face anywhere um so if you're 
doing those things, then the risk is significantly lower. And so if the benefit is your mental health and kind of enjoy, enjoying enjoying life as it is, then as of today, I think that's totally fine. And as things go forward, we'll just have to continue to listen to you know the public health agency and if they change, change those recommendations. Thank you very much. Thanks. I, that's my understanding as well is that um, the recommendations are still um, self isolation, social distancing, um, but there's no particular risk of being outside except when you're close to people. So if you say if you live in an apartment and there's a back green space and nobody's in it, go use it. And I see Olivia is sitting outside her house. Um, you know, get get some time outside if you can if you can safely still be isolated from people um and uh you know try and i know for me it feels weird being outside because we're we're so nervous about staying away from other people but if you have a, a patio or a deck go out there um and you know keep your windows wide open if you can it, like the, there's nothing about the environment that is going to immediately harm us. It's the people in it that we want to try and protect from us and and protect ourselves from them. I, I would suggest on the contrary, as much sun and fresh air as you can get within the constraints we're working within would be a really good thing. Absolutely agree. Um, I am just looking to see, so anyone else who's on Zoom and muted, um, if you have a question, I welcome it. It's going to be a little chaotic, but we'll try and take turns. Um, okay, I, I got one question by uh, message. Um, I'm just looking for it. If we live with a family, do we all self-isolate and even from each other? If we are completely at home all the time, do we need to be as diligent in washing? And I'm concerned about cleaning under my nails. So you know, if you are well, your family is well, then uh, no, you don't need to stay away from them. I um, think that, you know, just maintaining that good respiratory hygiene in the house and your hand hygiene in the house is good too. Um, and wiping down high contact areas. But otherwise, if everyone is well, then enjoy your time together. Um, if you're family member is unwell, um, then that would be the time to uh, try to distance yourself um, as much as you can. Hello, can you hear me? Hi, Carol, we have one, I just have one question ahead of you, I'll come back Sorry. to you. Uh, Jeff? Um, can you hear me? Yep. I'm, I'm in a, it's not really a question, I'm in a unique situation. I have an asthma attack and I've been tested for COVID-19. I'm in isolation at Kelowna General Hospital right now. <coughs> and uh, it's kind of brutal. <laughs> yeah. I have no fever, nothing like that. Just a really bad cough. That's tough. Do you have a, is there a question or you just wanted everyone to know? Just a comment, um, if that's okay. Um, yeah. Sorry to. No, no worries at all. I'm glad just, you're here. They're, they're so um, worried, and and you know I don't. I'm in a private room now. Even. I'm glad they're protecting you. Yes. Thanks for joining us, Jeff. I really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Uh, Carol. Hi. <clears throat> you can hear me. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much for this presentation, and to everybody. And I realize I can help a lot. But um, I also, I live in a downtown in the West End in a building that half seniors disabled, which I am, but half it's um, a very uh, street crowd. It's like, um, <clears throat> trying to be politically correct, it's like a, an Oppenheimer crowd. Mm -hmm. And uh, the manager is refusing to do anything because most, well, I'd say about half the tenants here are just saying it's, a, it's just the flu. And this is, of course, big time to get drunk and stoned. And the manager is not, he put a small sign up. I begged the man today to help us seniors that are disabled. 
how can I further push the manager, management team, to put a sign up to say this is not the flu, and we, we have a, a lot of drug dealers coming in and out, and they even live in the building, which they know. Um, but forgetting that, um, how can I do better to help protect myself and my building? Um, Carol, uh, thanks for your question. I'm, I'm going to jump in here, but then I'll ask um, our our uh, presenters if they have any thoughts too. The, my one question for you, Carol, is: Is your building privately owned, or is it owned by it's, it's housing? a non nonprofit? Okay, then that would be your next level. Is above the manager would be the the organization that runs the housing would be the next okay. one, and and possibly the public health. Um, like the CDC, or no, what would that be under Vancouver Coastal Health? Because they are the ones who police the safety of house of public housing. Okay, thank you very much. Any is anyone else have been put on that? Uh, the only thing I would make a comment on is um, uh, Bonnie Henry declared a public health emergency today. Um, it was just on the news before I join this and uh, perhaps that ups the level of urgency for the people managing the building. Mm -hmm. Just a thought. Definitely, that's a great one. That was Pete, right? Yes. Cool, thanks. Um, the other thing I would suggest, Carol, is if there's a separate exit that is less trafficked in your building, like if there's a parking area, even if you don't have a car. We, we, um, I, we, we have tried it all. Okay. And it's not just about me, as this is what this whole meeting is about. Yeah. This is about everybody. That's a good point. I think you just do what you can do to um, to let the people above the manager know that given the high risk population. I, I will do so. Thank you. Thanks. Um, uh, I have a question from Robin. Um, I don't have symptoms and I have a video chat doctor's appointment. Should I get tested? Um, Robin, there's a, a decision support uh, link. You can, it's called a self-assessment tool. And it's, the URL is further up in the, in the uh, chat and it's covid19.thrive.health. Um, and that is basically an online version of the decision making, uh, the decision support process for testing. So that's a piece of it. Um, Ashley, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, the, the guidelines for testing right now are if you have a um, severe illness that requires hospitalization or um, may need hospitalization and for healthcare workers and um, there's one, one other group, but it does say all of that on that website. And the easier way to get there, if you don't remember all of that, is just bccdc.ca, and it's right there on the front page. It says, take this self-assessment um, if you are wondering if you need to get tested. Thank you. Thanks. Um, Terry has a question. Hi, Ashley. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is like, I guess, well, this could be for anybody. Um, how do you appropriately explain, like, uh, I'm not gonna lie, I'm kind of terrified, okay? Um, and I have like a friend in town from Australia and she wants to see me and wants to make plans to go out for dinner and do all these things. And other people, you know, I've said, I'm not really into hugging. I'm not, you know, I'm normally a huggy person, but I don't want to hug you. And then, oh no, I don't have any symptoms. I'm okay. Don't worry. Let's just hug. And they're very touchy. And um, how do you just like really nicely say, get the F away from me? <laughs> like, I don't want to touch anybody. Right? No, I, I think it's pretty common, you know, um, I'm hoping with all of the um, like media announcements and today that um, public declaration, declaration that this is an emergency is kind of getting to people now and they're realizing that this is um, kind of more of serious of a situation than um, what we've seen before. And uh, yeah, it, are there words to say? I don't know. I think... Uh, like, get the F away from me is perfectly appropriate. 
I think, I think it's, it's totally okay to hold your boundaries. Sorry, Heather, is that you? I think there's an issue as well with, um, like some people are asymptomatic that, ha that carry the virus and pass it on. So that's the whole thing about like, this, like the kid not going back to school. The kids tend to be asymptomatic with those, um, those symptoms. So, and they can pass it on. It's like, I guess that's the big issue as well. I think that's right. No offense to your, to your friend, Terry, but they have no idea if they're transmitting it or not. And I think this is a circumstance where it's perfectly legitimate uh, for us to protect our, ourselves first. Um, and I think maybe, you know, it'll help you to find the words if you tell yourself, first of all, um, you know, I, I really need to care for myself and people need to understand that. And that's more important than my friend's feelings. Definitely. Um, I saw a really great article and I'm, I was looking for it, but I'll make sure to pop it in the email to everyone. Um, you're not the only one struggling with this, Terry. Um, I've heard this from a few other peers in the last two days, particularly folks who are sharing a house with um, people who are not high risk, who aren't tre treating it as seriously. Um, and the, I think that this is a situation in which it's okay to be, quote, selfish. You're not being selfish, but it's okay to stick up for your needs. And I think we all get why you're high risk and why you're scared. But um, with your friend, I think you have to say, you know, the world has changed. This is a pandemic um, and I am the highest risk person or one of the highest risk groups. And I can't afford to jeopardize my health. I love you, you're great. Let's do a FaceTime. Um, We'll, we'll see each other another day if we can get through this. Um, and you know, you, you have people who love you and who know you well enough that might, they can support you in this conversation too. If she doesn't listen to you, sick John on her. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice, Jocelyn. And I had just that conversation this morning with my roommate. So I share my apartment with a roommate and I went through with him uh, painstakingly and explained that I'm exposed to all the risks that he is exposed to. And so um, he's, you know, uh, about 15 years younger than me and very fit and very healthy and, and doesn't like being cooped up. And I explained to him that I need him to take on board precautions that may not be possible for him, but that are important for me. Um, that was a difficult but important conversation to have. So yes, Jocelyn, I think you're right. We need to stick up for ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you guys so much. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, and I see there's people asking in the uh, chat for specifics. Um, there's only so much that I can share or that our team can share with you in chat right now, but we will make sure to follow up if we haven't sent you what we said we would. Um, and this video will also be available online tomorrow. Um, it won't be pretty, I'm not going to edit it, <laughs> but we'll, uh, we'll share it on our social and um, and it'll be on our YouTube channel too. So um, I'll hold back the uh, email to all of you with the resources till I have a link to that video. Okay. So you'll probably get an email from me tomorrow. Um, okay. I think I've, uh, I'm, oh, um, there was one question uh, and a, a couple of messages. Lori said she's been able to find latex gloves on Amazon still for not very expensive, so keep checking back. Um, uh, keep in mind that if it, it if you've ordered from Amazon.com, it might take longer. Um, there is a lot of misinformation going around. A lot, a lot, a lot. Please be careful to always make sure that any advice you're given is either from a trusted medical clinical source or from the BCCDC, which is also a trusted source, um, or a trusted news organization. If you've read about the Stanford advice about like holding your breath as a test or any of that, it is not true. Um, it's a hoax. And please, if you see information, don't make a health decision on it until you've talked to someone who's a credible expert. 
that'd be Family Doctor, um, 811, um, the CDC. Um, it's really unfortunate, but people, I think, like to feel like experts and share stuff on their social and it confuses people. So as part of being your own best advocate, you have to be kind of cynical about advice unless you know the source. Jocelyn? Uh, yeah. This is Roger. Yes. Uh, there's a lot of information about getting tested or not being tested and so on and so forth. How does a person go about specifically actually getting the test if they need it? So if you go through this website, for example, and you know it'll tell you Cyphas South Isolator or whatever, but um, you know I don't seem to see many direct answers about how do you actually go about getting the testing. Ashley? Yeah. So um, for those who kind of meet the criteria to get testing, um, it's recommended that they call 811 and then they'll be directed to where to go to get that testing. There's specific locations that are set up. Some family doctors um, are set up to do it, um, but 811 is your resource there when you need it. And you'd have to contact them anyways if you had a, um, a severe illness that required testing. So just as a follow-up to that, mm -hmm. um, one of, you know, close contact of mine went through that and the uh, person on 811 was very unknowledgeable. Um, and one of the, one of your doctors had recommended there was going to be special testing places for healthcare workers and suggested that those of us on CISO might want to follow up on that. Um, do you have any information on that? Yeah, uh, so for healthcare providers um, that have had uh, direct contact or cared for somebody who has turned out positive to have COVID-19 and there was a break in their um, personal protective equipment or um, kind of there was an opportunity for them to have been exposed, then they would go on to site self-isolation and get tested um, and they have uh, sites set up kind of across the health region um, you know like for us here at GF Strong ours is over at uh, Blessin. So how do we so how does a person like someone I know went through that process yesterday and was not given any of this information by 811 for example um, so there's those would probably be in different health regions, I'm guessing. Uh, so I'm really back to there's really it's like we're being denied information about how do you actually get to the test testing. Um, so I'm still struggling with that. And I, I don't think anyone's trying like uh, meaningfully trying to withhold information about this. Um, I think that as we go forward, uh, the testing criteria has changed. And so it's just very specific people that require testing now. And uh, they're, they're making prioritizations. Um, and that's all directed by public health. Um, and so if we're, for example, in Fraser Health, which I am, yeah. and if I have a worker who has all the symptoms, um, how would you suggest they go about getting to testing because 811 didn't work right. so I'm just wondering if there's some other route that they can go through yeah so if they have uh, mild symptoms um, they don't require testing. more severe is not mild symptoms okay so if they have severe t uh, symptoms that require hospitalization or may soon require hospitalization then um, they'd have to call 811 back again and kind of relay that uh, the symptoms are severe now and that they'll be requiring hospitalization. Otherwise, testing isn't recommended um, or being offered right now. It's self-isolation for 14 days if somebody is able to manage at home. Okay, thank you. I think the problem must be with the 811 um, training or people because that was all articulated to them. So I guess I'll just tell them to follow up um, again. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Roger. I, um, I think I've seen a number for healthcare uh, providers to call, um, but I can't come up with it just this moment. So if I can find it, I'll send it to you because your caregiver 
I, I think would fall under that um, that category. So I think you that might be another route to go. If I can find it, I'll send it to you directly. Um, okay, so we had a, a couple of questions. Um, Olivia very rightly pointed out that everyone should practice social distancing, whether you're at higher risk or not, because um, we're all trying to flatten the curve, definitely, and pr protect each other. Um, Ian says, I have to fly to Vancouver for a couple of appointments. If I were to cancel, I was told it would take six months to get a new appointment. I have to arrange accommodation flights, etc. cetera. Um, should I really cancel my trip? Um, Ian, from my perspective, I doubt that anyone you were going to see is going to be able to see you. Um, I think your first course of action has got to be to call those offices until you get a hold of them and say, I'm flying down from wherever you're from, and these are all the things that I've had to do in order to make this visit happen. Um, can I keep it? Can we do this by um, telehealth or a call or something? You know, I've heard a lot of doctors have been a bit more flexible on that lately because they want to keep you out of risk. So. I, that would be my suggestion. I'm sorry if you've already tried that, but um, that, that's my first thought. Um, and Sally said, if one of your healthcare, if you're one of your care workers works in a facility and has someone on their unit with COVID, is it best not to have them come in to help you? Uh, when do you make that decision? Yes, it's best for them not to come in to help you and you make that decision right now. Okay. Uh, Jeff, do you have another question? Oh, you're muted. Hang on, unmute. There you go. Sorry, I've got a little bit of a comment again. Um, I've had bleeding noses for my test um, every day since Friday. Um, looks like I'm not going to be able to get out until Saturday because uh, it takes that long to have the test. I wouldn't, unless you absolutely have to have it, get it done because it is really uncomfortable. That's my understanding is it's like the flu test where they jam the thing right up your nose and then do a Q-tip. It's so, like a big long Q-tip. So, but you know, regardless of the nosebleed, if you need a test and you're yeah. recommended by a healthcare provider to get one, don't say no, follow instructions. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah, um, and, and I'm sorry I'll that your nose is hurt. That's yeah. not good. No, and I want to just say thanks to all the presenters. Me too. I really appreciate you guys being here. Um, I'm, I think what I'm going to do is turn it back over to our presenters for any last words that you'd like to share. Um, I'll, I'll just say, first of all, Jeff, thanks for joining us. Our, you know, our thoughts are with you right now. Um, and you know, for everyone who's going through this, um, you know, I'll just repeat what I said earlier. I think this is a real chance uh, for us to um, reach out to each other and support each other in unusual ways. And I think there are hopeful things that can come of this. Um, that's not to say this is not a very serious <laughs> event, um, but I, I think we can, we can make the best of this situation. Again, this is something that we're good at as people living with SCI. We make the best of difficult situations. Um, this, this, you know, uh, is probably uh, an extreme version of that. Uh, but I'm confident that we can we can get through um, by having each other's back. Definitely, Ashley. Oh, thank you guys. I really appreciate um, being able to be here and connect with all of you. And I, um, yeah, I there is good community around us. And um, yeah, you're right. Now's the time to keep connected. Um, I'm still doing telehealth visits, so if you have a concern that's coming out of this, we can connect. Um, I know that many people have had anxiety and stress, and that's impacted their, their bowel routines, and, you know, it's definitely something that I'm still available to um, connect over for the time being, and then, yeah, we, we'll, we'll get through this. Awesome. Um, I can share Ashley's details on how to get in touch with her in the email. Um, and 
uh, she's a great resource. We're really fortunate to have you. Thank you so much. Um, I believe that Paul Gauthier has already, I can say his name wrong, Gauthier, there we go. Um, uh, I believe Paul has gone, but if, I, if you're still here, Paul, feel free to wrap up with some last words. Nope. No. Okay. Um, Is there time for a last question? Oh, part, time for a last. Oh, okay. If it's super quick. I, I, I was with the specialist on Thursday. I waited a few months for the Diamond Center. Is it safe to go or not? Call first. Call first. Call first. Yeah, call first. You don't even know they're doing outpatient visits anymore. I, I, I've called several times and they're, they're open for business. Oh. Um, so it's a matter of do you go or not go? Um, and then go from there. And secondly, quickly, um, so friends coming by to visit that are healthy is fine. Family's fine. That's okay. I would not say, I'm, I'm jumping in here because it freaks me out. But um, friends coming by to visit, no. I Self-isolation means that nobody who isn't in your home comes to see you or is in your space within six feet. I mean, you could open the window and talk out outside. <laughs> like, you could get creative, you could talk on the phone, but it's really, self-isolation means they should stay in their home and you should stay in yours. And the family, same thing. Do they live in your house? No. Unless you need them, like, need them to help you as a caregiver, I would I would strongly recommend not. Everything we are being told by the CDC and by Health Canada says stay, like basically shelter in place, um, stay in your house and don't contact other people who don't live with you. Thank you. And by contact, I don't mean like don't call them, just don't be yeah. within that six feet window. Um, I don't, I, I mean, I don't know what Ashley or John would say, but I would not go to that appointment. And I, I totally understand, like, it's going to be three months before I can get Botox again. But you just have to sort of picture in your mind how close you'll be with people in those elevators in the Diamond Center. And I mean, if you can strategize a way around it, if they'd be willing to come out to your car or something, that might be a way of doing it. But if it's just a specialist appointment, like a conversation in a room, ask them if they'd be willing to spend that time they allocated to you talking to you on the phone. Yeah. Uh, Justin, I think that makes sense. And I think Ashley might have, you know, the, the, the sort of more educated professional opinion here, but I'll just chime in and say that I think um, we've all been through a lot and getting through two weeks of being by ourselves at home is a small price to pay to come out the other side healthy. And this is the time to err on the side of caution. Yeah. Very nice, thank you. Sorry, I know that's probably not what you wanted to hear, but. No, it's fine, I'm, very, I can I'm happy with that, so thanks all. And thank you for everyone involved, this has been great, thank you. Okay. Um, can I <laughs> Oh, okay. We've got more questions. All right. I won't keep you longer than in the next 10 minutes, if you guys can spare it. Um, uh, I have I saw a hand up from Dave as well. So, it, Lori, do you want to go first and then Dave? Okay. Thank you. I'm asking on behalf of somebody else. Yeah, the caregiver come in, you love a Cecil, but the caregiver is bad, like really bad. And he doesn't know what to do. The, the guy's walking billboard for the virus. And Kim has tried to say something, but he's not registered. What did he do? I'm not oh, sure if, oh, did you hear that, Ashley? I didn't hear I it. I did, all. yeah. So okay. uh, basically a caregiver um, 
you know, they're not able to communicate effectively um, together. And um, I think even just what we talked about, like with friends earlier, um, just being able to advocate that boundary and kind of what 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 it is that you need. And um, if that conversation isn't happening or going through with um, the caregiver themselves, then is there somebody kind of um, above, above that caregiver that you could go to and connect with to advocate for your needs? Um, I, th I think that's one of the challenges of Cecil too, if, you're, if that's what you're on, because it's so, you know, you are the employer, um, whereas if it's an agency, you can, you can deal with someone above them. Um, so if you are on Cecil, I definitely recommend you give Paul Gauthier a call um, or an email and we'll include his information in there. Um, he, just a really good general source of info on caregivers. We also have our Cecil uh, employers handbooks on our website under the info center tab, um, which includes some of that information about dealing with dis disputes. Um, it's not specific to viral pandemics, but it's some information. Um, and, and I think connecting with uh, folks around you who have care, caregivers and um, connecting to, you know, getting their advice and how they've dealt with those problems. Um, if, you, if you need some connections with peers who have caregivers, um, we can probably help you out with that um, or your friend out with that. Um, I'm getting a lot of thank yous, which I really appreciate. Um, we, we wanted to know this just as much as you did. And, um, and you know, we, we definitely see this situation as a, a really crucial moment that none of us expected. And um, that, you know, what would we be if we weren't trying to help, you know, ensure that you're safe and healthy and happy and us too. Um, I, I'm just, I don't see any other questions, so I'm going to call it. Um, oh, John, and that was, sorry, it's Dave. Oh, yeah. Sorry, Dave, you had the I other question. That's okay. My, my it's bad. Very, yeah, no, thank you very much for organizing, and thanks for everybody participating. Uh, just very quickly, I don't see the, uh, you said that uh, the screen that went up about hygiene practices was on the website, but I don't see it. I just wonder if you could direct me to where that would be. I can probably put a link in the chat. All right, that would be great. It's it's um, linked on those SCI guidelines. Um, I'm just looking. Oh, geez. Yeah, I don't. I opened them all. I didn't see that one specifically, but. Okay. Um, so it's the title is it says. Um, there's a section that says attendance services issues in the guideline. The last bullet point says read this article from Public Health Ontario regarding people providing assistance. And then if you click on that link, Public Health Ontario uh, fact sheet COVID-19 guide isolation caregivers. I click don't know that. why I don't. You talking about the SCI website? No, it's the guidelines that John was sharing. So there's a link in the chat to it. Um, Oh, well. My and I'm just looking to see if I can share that link again. Um, Hello. Hi, Sheila. Here it is. Oh, hi. Um, hang on, I'm just going to no. mute. <laughs> I'm just going to mute um, our friend Jeff here. Um, and then I can share the, there we go, I found it. So it's under attendance services issues. Uh, and it's a Public Health Ontario link. I just, I, just, I just put it in the chat. You got it? Oh, awesome. Perfect. There we go. You guys um, see it there? Yep, fantastic. That's a great resource. Thanks, John. Um, the uh, I would if you get services from uh, the respiratory outreach program from Prop or Till, I'd also contact them um, in terms of specifics about um, your supporting you and your uh, independence at home. And I know uh, Paul Gochi is going to put out um, a, an email if he hasn't already to the Cecil peers which will have some of the same information in it. So um, I think we're all doing our best to just try and like predict some of the major questions or answer the ones we're getting a lot of. 
um, but don't stop asking them. We'll do our best. And one thing that came up in a previous meeting, if you have an urgent need that you, you've done your best to answer, you've contacted us, you've contacted other resources, and you can't figure out how to answer it, and it's related to your condition, you can call, you can call your MLA, your local constituency office. Like, if you are facing that many barriers and you're really in trouble, it's okay to ask. I know it's a little crazy. You might not get through to them right away. Um, that's certainly on my list in terms of when we hear of people who might not have a caregiver because they're sick or they have kids to raise, you know, kids at home. That's part of it. And I, I know our MLAs are doing what they can to uh, make sure we have what we need and to fill the gaps. So, um, so we, you know, you try and not go to them for everything, but if you need, if you have an urgent need that nobody else can answer and you need an advocate, that's one route into the system. So just a thought there. Um, Jocelyn, uh, Terry here. In the comments, I've included Dr. Viet Vu's article and yeah. that was part of technology for living and prop is under that umbrella as well so yeah um and that's when i'll share it's a really great, great article along yeah. with our one from dr road as well um the dr road one's a little scary but it's it's real so just uh, some more motivation to uh, keep yourself uh isolation up um uh okay i think i'm gonna call this and if you have other questions we didn't get to um, you, I will be sending you information on how you can, uh, contact Ashley and, um, talk with her. Uh, you can also just email me back with questions and we'll find an answer. Um, our info line team is still at work. We all work from home anyway. And, um, and we're there for your questions Monday to Friday, nine to five. Um, the info line numbers on our website. Um, 1-800-689-2477. That might be the only time I've ever remembered it. Um, okay, everyone stay well, stay in touch, and um, take care. Thanks, Jocelyn. Great to see everyone. Thank Thanks. Take care, everyone. Thanks, all. Appreciate it. Thank you. From Maureen. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the chat. I see something inappropriate in everybody's ears. Thank you. Thank you from Susan. See ya. Hey. Stay safe.